Well, good morning. We'll get started. Sorry to interrupt. Before we get started, we'll uh, have a moment of prayer. And we're in 1 Corinthians today for our Bible study. And uh, we, if you look at your bulletin, if you have one in front of you, we want to consider Christina. Sandra, Christina's here today, but she's got ailments. Pat, family. Rick's here, so surgery was successful. Samantha, having testing done. Dell and Gail. Leonard. Does they consider what to do? And uh, Regina's uncle. And then those that are shut in. Are any other people that we need to pray for this morning? Okay. Well, let's go to the God in prayer. Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be able to come to you this morning and pray. And we pray through the name of Jesus Christ. We ask you to consider us as some of your children. I've come here to consider your word, rely upon it and have it lead us through this week. Father, we pray the things we do here this morning will be bring honor to and glory to you. We thank you for your son who founded the church, who's our leader, who we <clears throat> speak to you through. Father, we ask that you to be with those that we've considered this morning that are sick and ailing and those that are spiritually of need of your help. We rejoice for those that were baptized last Sunday and give all the glory to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now, I forgot to mention that a couple was here last Sunday morning. Uh, Tommy worked with them after services, and they're in the bulletin. We bat had two baptisms, so that's always something to rejoice about. We're in 1 Corinthians. This is a commentary by Mike Willis. <clears throat> As always, if you're viewing from home, we appreciate your comments and thoughts. <clears throat> We're considering spiritual gifts again this, this uh, week. <clears throat> and uh, here in your book, it says the static utterances uh, that people going through. <clears throat> We're also employed in the worship of Dionysus, the god of wine. The cult was active in Corinth, as seen in this mosaic of a false god excavated from Rome, the, a Roman villa in Corinth. Some of the Corinthians were once led away into these dumb idols. So we're working with a church that has spiritual gifts. These are miraculous. As I've said before, uh, we are all blessed with spiritual gifts, but I can't say they're all miraculous. Um, in fact, we're going to see where these things seem to have faded away. Now, there's still some spiritual gifts going on. I'm not here to diminish that at all. But the miraculous ones, we're going to see where we think they faded away. Uh, in chapter 12, Paul spoke to the church about the different spiritual gifts. Uh, he speaks about the unity of these gifts. They all came from God. And this chapter, which is often preached about, spoke about, is this love and duration, where love will dur endure to eternity, these spiritual gifts will fade, will fade away. And in the next chapter, we'll look into some of the regulations of the church. This chapter is divided into gifts that are worthless, one through three, the attributes of love and the evidence of its superiority, and four through seven, and then the duration of love over other gifts. <clears throat> and then this first section is 13, 1 through 3. And we'll ask Evelyn if she wouldn't mind 
reading, we're going to consider what Paul talks about here as a symbol that's when found in Greece. It was a clanging bell, and that's all it was worth without love. Okay, Evelyn. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Thank you. Okay, and again, I'm reading from the, or what I have up here is the King James Version. They use the word charity and we won't go dive in deep we have a thought of charity in our vernacular which is different than what Paul's speaking of here this kind of charity is a sacrificial charity or sacrificial love so he's saying that <clears throat> if I speak a tongues and in your commentary it's going to bring out the idea I don't really elaborate it here that this speaking of tongues seemed to be the most premier of all the gifts that they were, you know, puffed up about if they could speak in tongues, which would be foreign languages or a language different than the one they were brought up with. And he talks about prophecy, which again is a word that we have mistaken. It's not the same word here. It's the idea of things that weren't given to them yet by inspiration. And then uh, all knowledge they weren't given yet. But he's saying this kind of faith that could move mountains that Jesus speaks about, all these things are no good without love. And then finally, we're going to consider this book portion of the word here where he talks about if I give my body to be burned. So Paul speaks to the highest expression of gifts, the miraculous gifts, and these examples, the greatest sacrificial service, but emphasizes without love, they're all worthless. Tongues, prophecy, knowledge, faith, faith, this miraculous faith, uh, what they would be able to understand better than most of us would. It means nothing without love. Uh, he talks about tongues in this section, the tongues of angels. And uh, the commentator and I sort of agree to this idea that these utterances that even tongues of angels which might think of they could understand all languages they could speak to somebody in any other any language whereas in the church here in Corinth they might have been able to speak a certain tongue but I think he's giving the idea here that angels could speak any tongue and so if you were complete master of all the tongues it's no good without love There's an application, of course, for us today, isn't there? In the church, no matter what talent we have, no matter what we can do for the Lord, if we don't have love, then what is it worth? If we don't have love for one another, what is it worth? And we've seen the, those of us that have been around for a while, seen the consequences of gifts without love. The things we do and say to our brothers can be terrible at times, and we forgot about love and our zeal. <clears throat> Paul talks here about bestowing one's goods to the poor or giving one body to be burned. And there's much discussion in commentaries uh, what all this means. Of course, we see that even in today's world, we'll see people will be so uh, enthused for a cause that they'll burn themselves. It's terrible. We've seen it here in, the, in our own country here in the last month or two. But this 
commentary and some others I looked at considered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where they went into the eternal fires that were given to them because they would not follow God and they would not practice the things that were going on in their Babylon, which was, you know, Shadrach is Daniel. And so <clears throat> the ultimate gift of sacrifice that you might consider without love, it means nothing. I think it's what Paul's saying here. <clears throat> and so now we'll go on and read uh, ne the next section. And we'll ask Lori to do this 13, 4 through 7. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Okay. Thank you. And again, Charity, there is uh, King James Version, which Lori is reading from, but it's a kind of a love. It's, a, it's more of a sacrificial love he's defining here. Doth not behave itself unseemly, does not provoke evil, does not rejoice in iniquity. <clears throat> so we're going to, in the, in the assembly, or the book here talks about defining some of these. We're going to look into those. It also asks these questions. I'll skip the questions, but we're going to do, delve into what he means. So the assembly here was in strife because of tongue speaking, they believe. And the prophets vied with each other over who could speak prophecy. And there was a lot of disorderly conduct going on, unedifying things for the body. And so Paul says that the solution here is to grow in their love, I would say, for Christ and the church and their love for one another, which is the church. So he's going to define these. And again, we've these are a subject of many lessons, but I think it's some things to consider. The first one is he says, suffereth long, to be long in temper, opposite of being short-tempered. I know if you were like me as a youth, patience and temperance weren't uh, qualities that we had, and we had to learn those. And uh, these things were going on as ba we might consider them as babes in Christ in the church. Uh, he tells them they need to be kind to one another. This word in the Greek, which I'm not going to try to pronounce, it shows one's self-mind to be kind, Thayer says, to be considerate of what somebody else might be going through. We all have, we all travel down through life and we don't always know what the other person's going through. And so we, when the, something happens that we might not consider right, we might have to think about what they're going through. And sometimes we don't know. Envieth not, the verb here is zalu, can be used in a good or bad sense. To burn with zeal, to have a bent, bad sense of it means to be moved with envy. So I think we, we all understand that one. Uh, vaunt it itself. Again, here this word comes up again, which is another form of puffed up, bragging. Love does not brag. And so some in the Corinthian church here, their thinking was that they were bragging about their spiritual gifts and provoking the others to envy. Um, and then he goes on to talk about more specifically puffed up again. So I had an opportunity to speak to the congregation. We listed all the areas in Corinthians, like five or six verses where Paul used the same word, fisuio, meaning inflated concept of one's own importance. 
So, of course, we don't see that going on today, do we? Not in the world, not in the church. I don't see it happening here, but I have seen it before. I saw a song leader that seemed to <laughs> vaunt himself. Very good song leader. He even sang with a toothpick in his mouth. I don't know how he did that. And uh, he would never stand up here. He'd stand down there and beautiful voice. And, you know, every four or five times he'd get up and explain why he was doing that. And as I'm told, nobody cares. <laughs> but it caused such a problem that they, they went over his house one night and met with him, and that caused a big division. So these things are relevant. They do happen. I'm sure you all could tell me stories too, but um, he says we don't need to behave unseemly, disgraceful, indecent, rude, dishonorable. We should not seeketh her own or have this self-consideration for only our own wishes. And of course, we've seen that too before. And, and that comes back to some of the other things he was saying where the ladies were trying to get more involved in the worship part of the service. And he talks about how there's an order from God that we're not to provoke him as the angels did. And so he brings up the word provoked. Not easily provoked means to spur on, stimulate, stir anger. Love does not go around, he says here, with a chip on its shoulder. Think of no evil. He were, uses the word logosiomia, I think, which means running a ledger of offenses committed against oneself. In other words, some people, you know, tally up all the offenses that one has caused them. And so then there, you know, we need to forget about those things that we might think sometimes people offend us, we don't even realize it. Or maybe that's not the right word, but we don't consider each other's concerns. And so we, when that happens to us, he says we're not supposed to remember it anymore, or keep a ledger of it. And if we do, then it does build up. Pretty soon we have a, what we call a chip on our shoulder. Rejoice not in iniquity. How much, how relevant is this? Some people love it when somebody else falls into despair. <laughs> Even in the church, uh, we shouldn't have glee, he says, for witnesses somebody, witnessing somebody's fall into sin. We all have struggles with sin and the consequences thereof. And then rejoice in the truth. Love comes from truth, hearing it preached, seeing it obeyed, watching it influence spread on such things. I've run across this. Some people have a preconceived idea of what the Bible says, and they're not open to any suggestions about what might be said that's a little different than their thinking. So they, we call it closed thinking. And uh, if you try to develop another idea, uh, they even become offended from it. And so, uh, you know, we need to take on the idea that we might have this wrong, and another brother might bring up something that we, we need to really consider again, think through. Uh, it's not what our parents taught us, for those that were raised in the church with our parents. So uh, these things I've run against Concepts, especially when it comes to heaven and all that. Uh, we don't understand it all, but we need to remain open and seek a better understanding. This is what God would have us to do. This is inspired writings from Paul, from the Holy Spirit. And then he says we need to bear all things. Sustained love learns to bear injustice as it suffers. And we see Christ as the ultimate example of that as he asked the Father to forgive them for they know not what they do. He says to believe all things that is not 
<clears throat> arguing over things, believe the best of others, uh, hope with all things, keep hoping for the truth and the, that will come to a fellow man that's suffering, not believing the worst of fellow man, enduring all things in spite of offenses against Christ, he steadfastly endured. Okay, we'll go on to the next reading. Uh, Evelyn, you want to try that? We'll go through 8 through, two, eight through eight 10. Through yeah, and then I'll have Lori read the balance. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Okay, we'll stop there for a second. <clears throat> when we look at this last chapter, the diversity of gifts, he tells that the church is still from the same spirit, uh, and there's divisions of ministration, they're from the same Lord, there's diversities of the operation, the same God. We all have different gifts. Okay, now we'll ask Lori to read on. When I was a child, I speak as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Okay, thank you. So he speaks about... <clears throat> all these gifts that are there in the church but one's never going to go away and that's love charity he says there'll be tongues they'll cease there'll be knowledge it shall be vanished away for we know in part and we prophesy in part and we're very familiar with these scriptures but some in the world today look at it a different way uh, we'll consider that a little bit talks about when he was a child and he's talking spiritually now but he's using the metaphor as the physical sense that he spake as a child but he's put the childish things away so all these things they're doing he says you're getting childish about them and you're not remembering the most important one and that's love the permanence of that the temporal nature of the gifts the love will never fail. These things you're hanging on to right now are going to go away. <clears throat> Paul lived during the age of spiritual gifts. And I might add the word miraculous, spiritual gifts. But he foretold these things would cease, the word cessation there, when the perfect shall come. And this idea of when the perfect will come uh, is in much discussion even today. And that's how we have the Pentecostals. Because they believe the perfect hasn't come yet. And so we'll, we'll look at that briefly. These signs shall follow them that believe, Jesus said in Mark 16, 17. So the disciples were first, or the apostles, would, they would later be called, were first given these signs to verify as the word had not been written down yet. But he says these things are going to cease. And we have to keep in context Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, which was in the first century, and these gifts were still going on. And uh, we believe that he's putting it in here. These things will exist until the revelation of God's will was complete. Things existing now, or this in part, this period of future time that hadn't come yet, he says is prophecy, tongues, the word of knowledge, faith that abides, Faith that hopes, 
love or the faith, hope, love, and uh, faith will abide. And then we put up this graph that's in your book. Prophecies, he says, they'll fail. Tongues, they shall cease. Word of knowledge shall vanish away. But faith, hope, and love abides. Abides means it stays. It's hooked into the church. There's much discussion regarding what is meant by the perfect. Some understand the perfect to refer to the second coming of Christ and teach spiritual gifts that shall continue till Christ return. I know from in the secular world a long time ago, I was talking with a man that carried his Bible with him at work. And we got into a discussion of where he went to congregate and where I went to congregate. We called it going to church. And I found that he was Pentecostal. And so I, he and I, I said, you know, we, we, st we talked enough where we could study and uh, not get into, you know, I made sure that it wouldn't hurt his feelings or something. So we considered these, this ver these verses right here. And I asked him what this meant because, you know, my understanding is these things are complete now and that these things are going to go away. They still spoke in tongues at the Pentecostal church. They still had prophecy going on at the Pentecostal church. And so he explained it to me that they believe that when Christ returns, then tongues, prophecy, all these things will go away. Of course, I took him to 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in 15, 16, 17, but that did not compute with him. So, and in context, we always, when we study the Bible, we need to keep things in context. Paul never brings up in this chapter anything about Christ's return. He's talking about the development of miraculous gifts in the church and about love and how all these things work together to edify the body, not tear it apart. And uh, then he talks about the perfect, which in the Greek would mean complete. And so to me, logically, these things make sense. Like I said before, I don't hear people at the church speaking in tongues. Now at home, I'm not gonna you know, say that things like this don't happen. Uh, prophecy and knowledge happen at my house. I told you so. Some people seem to understand the future better than others, right? And so those things still happen at home. Uh, there's things I don't understand, you know, there. But here, I, it's pretty clear to me because I have the complete written word to rely on. In fact, in 2 Timothy, we often go to there, chapter 3. Paul tells us we have everything to bring us now to salvation. That didn't happen yet. That still wasn't going on at the church here. They didn't have everything they needed to bring them to complete salvation, a complete understanding. And we still don't understand completely. And I would argue that, yeah, there's some things we won't understand until Christ returns and brings us home his faithful home to heaven. It doesn't say he's even going to touch the earth. He says we'll meet him in the air. So in your book, very good graph, these signs shall follow them that believe. Jesus told them that. We see that shortly after that, we have the Corinthian church. Paul speaks of these things that will go away and cease when the coming of the perfect comes, which we think is the complete written word. This idea of in part is this tongue speaking prophecy, these things that would fill in the word that wasn't there, that would reveal and confirm 
his capital, which is God's will to man. See, there's a lot of people coming through and speaking things about what they thought they knew about God. But God would signify by signs that it was from him and not from man. When the perfect comes, completely get the complete real will of God. And why wouldn't we in this age have a complete revelation from God to us? If we didn't have it, then we wouldn't have a chance, would we? It doesn't make sense that we need to wait for Christ's return to completely understand what it costs, what we need for salvation. Uh, in James chapter 1, 25, we have a law, and he says it's the perfect law of liberty. Perfect means complete. While James, we think, is the brother of Jesus writes this chronologically, it is later. He says also now we have everything, the complete law of liberty. Not liberty to commit sin, but liberty in Christ. We no longer have to fear the condemnation and the wrath of God if we have Christ in our lives. And it's all we, we have a couple here today that committed themselves last week and to Christ. Now they have Christ within them and they are learning the perfect law of liberty to stay in the faith. We need to continue to be faithful until death. But we have everything with the Bible. That's why here we do what the Bible says. We don't add anything. We don't have a piano here. We don't have a Pastor, those things aren't in the scriptures. We have pastors. We're blessed to have pastors, elders, bishops, and they're all the same terms to say that they have been given the position of leading the local congregation. We understand now we have a complete key to salvation. And so that's versus the part that the Corinthians had. They had partial knowledge of what God's total revelation was for them as it was being written down. Uh, we expound on this in this chapter because there's a lot of misunderstanding in the secular religion world today or the religious world today, the denominational world, I would say. And so we have those that have divided among the church because they believe that these spiritual gifts are still occurring. <clears throat> we shall know fully, he says, when the time that miraculous gifts would cease, then the childhood of the church would move on to be into completion. And this was God's plan. They were the age, he says, when they were looking through a glass darkly or unclearly. And I asked this individual I was studying with about this. And uh, I, to I told him that you know, we believe that now we have a clear understanding of God's will for man. But in contrast, all these spiritual gifts, faith, hope, and love, would endure through the Christian era, which we are in. And then the superior one of all was love. It was superior to both faith and hope, Paul says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 13, and it endures through eternity. And of course, we know that makes sense because the Bible tells us that God is love and that Christ, which was God in the flesh, endured all these things that we'll remember next hour as he sacrificed himself for us. And Paul writes about that kind of agape love. No story man would ever tell that their leader would die for their servants. Yet that's what Jesus did. And that's what we remember in the Lord's Supper, this kind of love that endures. And we remind ourselves of it weekly because we know that Without this love, we wouldn't have a chance. 
without this kind of sacrificial love, all we did here this morning would be in vain. And there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. That's why even when we're baptized, we don't baptize ourselves, do we? Somebody does that for us, but it's the power of God that raises us up. As Paul talked about earlier in this chapter, we're new creatures. Okay, we'll go on and ask some questions now. In your book it says, what are the tongues of men and the tongues of angels? Chapter 13, 1. And what does it mean to be a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal? <clears throat> Paul imagines a case of the gift of tongues. And even if it's in the highest degree that they could speak all languages as the angels do. Without love, he says, it's all just noise. <clears throat> Three and four, what are the mysteries of 13.2? And could anyone literally do the following, speak in tongues of all men, speak in tongues of all angels, know all mysteries, uh, be able to move mountains through faith? If one should have the gift of prophecy to know all mysteries, that is God's hidden purpose that hadn't been completely revealed. He says, without any, all these, even if you had all these things, if you don't have love, that means nothing. Why are these things useless without charity or love? And why do the greatest acts of sacrifice or benevolence have no value in meeting without love? As we just said, without love, he says there is of no benefit. So if we can't do it out of love, then we don't need to do it. Uh, <clears throat> give the meaning of the following attributes. We just covered them in great detail in chapter 13, 4 through 7. And I would suggest that you reflect on those during the week. Commit them to prayer. There's certainly areas here that we can all work on and improve on as Christians. And uh, although we've given it great parlance in the past, it's good to look through these and consider them now and then. In what manner is love superior to spiritual gifts? according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. What it makes it superior, this one gift of love. Yeah. The, superiority, the superiority of it is that it's permanent. The other ones are temporal in nature. The contrast is that love will never fail. It'll never go away. And again, Paul lived through this age of spiritual gifts. And he foretells of the cessation of them. What did Paul say would happen to prophecies, tongues, gift of knowledge, and love? And what did he say these things would happen, uh, would happen to the spiritual gifts? He said, prophecy shall fail. Tongues shall cease, the word of knowledge shall vanish away, but faith abides, hope abides, and love abides. And the greatest of these that abide is love. What is the perfect in 13.10? And explain what Paul means in 13.9. As we said, the perfect refers to this word teleon, which means completeness, completeness. It seems in context he's talking about these things that we don't know right now about. And nowhere else in the Bible is God in the flesh, Jesus referred to as completeness. We, we understand he's perfect and everything, but there's really no, this word not used to describe Jesus. 
That's another thing I talked to this fellow about that day. <clears throat> and I'm sure that these Pentecostals use these gifts today to show each other how preference they are in God's eyes. Paul says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. And again, this word prophecy means knowledge that had not been completely given down from God to man. What did he mean in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 11 through 12? He says, when I spake as a child, I understood as a child, as though as a child, when I became a man, I put away these childish things. I can tell you these things still exist in church today. <laughs> There's sometimes when we act as children. We get hurt, we get offended, we act childish. And he says, reflect on the other things that I've just talked to you about. We need to adore each other. And then he says, for now we see through uh, a glass darkly, but when we see face to face, for I know in part, then shall I know in part, even so as I've known. Uh, we don't see it so much today, but even a hundred years ago or so, mirrors got cloudy. You might be able to barely see yourself in them. And you didn't know for sure if that was even you in the mirror. And now when you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror, yeah, that's me. That's me in all my glory. And so he uses that analogy of a mirror. In those days, they might not have had mirrors like we think of them, but, you know, they, they had shiny things that could they see themselves through. Metallurgy was pretty good back then. <clears throat> and again, the future of the following, faith, hope, and love would endure, and uh, we've already kind of covered it. <clears throat> These would endure through the Christian area, error, but love is superior. And faith gives away the sight of, of hope. Hope will be replaced by the attainment for those things that we hope love will continue through the Christian era. Love is superior to both faith and hope. Any other comments or questions or things that they would like to add. This is a familiar chapter for, for, all, for those of us that <clears throat> have been in the church for a while, but it's good to ponder those things again. And you might have an opportunity to talk to somebody about spiritual gifts and you can explain to them your understanding. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be in less than 15 of your book chapter 14. We only have a couple chapters to go now. That's it. And I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.